Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 29 of Death Space Filling the Void. You know, we're after after the holidays here, just January, days are short. Feeling that seasonal depression, feeling down a bit. COVID numbers are jumping back up. We haven't really dealt with the, I guess, years, or haven't had a chance, the, year, the years of, of COVID we've already dealt with. And just having the numbers go back where they are is just, it's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. Definitely been a, a bit of a struggle week, but trying to hang in there and, and, and make the best of it. I did perform at Theater 99. I've been performing short form and, and long form improv comedy. Had a fun show on Friday. One of the drunkest audiences I've seen ever in my career. <laughs> uh, just like one guy who was later discovered to have had multiple bottles of fireball under his chair was just like nodding off and like unable to follow what was happening and just like blurting things out you know making an ass of himself and and ruining it for everybody else that was just uh looking to have fun i also made rabbit for the first time cooking has become something that i've used a lot during the pandemic to be creative and try new things and have a project it's just how my brain works it's nice to have a project and something else to focus on and so i made i I roasted it in white wine garlic some mirepoix mirepoix i don't know how to say it i just know how to chop it all up if if you don't know it's carrots celery and onion roasted the carrots in that and then i made a broccoli cheddar soup that i cut the rabbit up into and and although i did try some pieces of it just roasted delicious very very good so yeah, that opens a that opens another. I've cooked. I've learned how to cook alligator pretty well down here. Can work on rabbit. Gonna make some quail, and I'm also uh, yeah, I'm experimenting a lot with vegan. So you know, before you start thinking I'm just some carnivore just trying to eat everything, I'm, I'm giving plants a shot too. i surprised myself. I made some uh, cauliflower steaks recipe Jamie and I got from watching Queer Eye. Great show. Great show. Well, I hope you're you're hanging in there and doing the best you can and everyone you, you know is safe with all these COVID numbers going up. Do have a, a very interesting interview lined up today. I interviewed Rita Lucarelli, who is a an Egyptologist at Berkeley. We talked about ancient Egypt and, and what we know about ancient Egyptians' view on death. We talked about mummification, of course, and, and got into why they were mummified. I guess I, I never really knew why so it's kind of cool to, to hear the their thought process and i think the takeaway is that ancient egyptians don't seem to be we're we're more afraid of death now than they were then we gotta get back there well yeah you're really gonna enjoy the the interview but before we get there i want to remind you to if you're liking the show remember to rate and review it on whichever platform you're listening to it on and to check the show out on facebook instagram twitter and youtube all right Thank you so much to Rita. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy. Joining me now on the podcast is Dr. Rita Lucarelli, who's a uh, Egyptologist. Rita, thank you so much for for coming on today. You're welcome. Nice to be here. For for the viewer or the listeners, they know that we talk about death and and grief and, and psychology, but we haven't talked about anything historical. And so I thought ancient Egypt was such a, a wonderful place to start. So get, getting going here, wh- what made you want to become an Egyptologist? Well, I guess it's been always my love for the past. And uh, I started to study archaeology, first of the Greek and Roman world. But then I was also interested in the Middle East uh, and the African worlds and languages. So I studied uh, studied Arabic and then uh, in my university in Naples, the Orientale University of Naples is its name, there was a course of Egyptology available and I took the exam and then I, I decided that that was going to be my specialization. And since then, I didn't stop anymore studying. <laughs> all Egypt all the time. Yes, so Egypt. Why do you think ancient Egypt has kind of captured the world's imagination? Is it the amount of artifacts that are left behind and, and preserved so well? What, what do you think it is? 
Yeah, definitely. I think the fascination for ancient Egypt has to do with those incredible monuments, really amazing uh, productions of humankind. Of course, the most famous of all are pyramids, and we still don't know exactly how they were built. So there is the old mystery around ancient Egypt and its world, and of course, mummification, but also the beauty of art. And so the phenomenon that we call Egyptomania has started very early. I would say the first Egyptomaniacs were the Greeks, the Romans. So as soon as uh, foreigners arrived in Egypt, uh, they were fascinated uh, by those monuments and they started to try to understand them, if not studying them scientifically. Uh, at the beginning, they were still into all what ancient Egyptian produced. And so they, they told us stories about, and uh, this fascination uh, grew in time. Mm -hmm. What is it that allows for all of these monuments, you know, the pyramids and, and everything else that's discovered about ancient Egypt? Is it just the lack of water and, and humidity? What, what allows all those monuments and, and artifacts to remain? more so than elsewhere? Oh, well, those who, which remain so well preserved are uh, monuments made in uh, hard stone. Mm. And in what we miss in ancient Egypt are mostly urban uh, structures, cities, villages. We don't have much about houses. We don't know much about daily life of the ancient Egyptians in, since not much is kept since they mm. were uh, houses, for instance, were built in mud bricks, mm -hmm. while uh, monuments like pyramids, temples, tombs of the elite, they were built in stone. And this was, uh, of course, not, uh, it did not happen by chance, but because the ancient Egyptians wanted these kind of monuments to stay there forever, to survive uh, themselves as well. Yeah, just it's like a form of uh, immortality, I guess. Exactly, yes. They, they believed in the immortality of the soul, and at the same time, they wanted their monuments to be immortal as well. Well, they've done certainly a, a good job. We're sitting here in 2021, and right. they're still standing. So what... Let, let's, let's jump into the, the thoughts in, in ancient Egypt about around death. What do we, what do we know... Yeah, for, for the ancient Egyptians, death was actually a new beginning, a new life. Especially they believed that they will be in the company of the gods. They believed in many gods and gods were immortal. The gods were there forever. So the main wish of the king, but also of the elite and of all other kind of people was to survive in eternity with the gods in their own uh, conceived netherworld. So life after death took the form of uh, life on earth with uh, regions of the netherworld that are well illustrated on papyri or on tomb walls with a lot of inhabitants of uh, this other world. So gods, demons, and the dead then traveling through those regions and became become, becoming at the end a blessed spirit that for them was a sort of immortal soul. Oh, wow. So correct me if I'm wrong, the advanced practices of the pyramids and, and we can go into the traditions of, of, of the burial, but is that all a means to help them go on this journey from their earthly lives through to this nether world that you're describing? Yeah, definitely. In order to survive in the nether world, first of all, the body is to be intact. And this is why they, they were using mummification. And we have different type of mummification, some made for the most wealthy people and a bit of cheaper mummifications process for people who could not afford the, the mo most complex one. And so the body has to be intact, mummified in the tomb. Um, the living have to bring offerings to the tomb, have to remember the name to perpetuate the, the memory of the deceased on earth. 
in order for the spiritual part of the disease to travel in the netherworld and be assimilated to the to the gods. So they really believed, uh, for instance, that destroying one's tomb will mean uh, uh, condemn that person to basically not surviving uh, uh, death. Oh, wow. The way to survive death was to have the body intact and to let the spiritual part, if we want to call it soul, although their um, idea was a bit more complex, to make the spiritual part be uh, free to move around, basically. Oh, wow. And also to come back to the body, they believed in the Ba. The Ba is a sort of soul, it's represented uh, as a bird with human head, with mm. the the head of the of the dead and the ba could go out of the tomb uh, visit uh, earth and then but then he always said to go back to the body we have a really lot of text and depictions of these beliefs in uh, different parts of the human being after death and how they interact uh, with each other so beside the ba for instance there was the ka was another spiritual part uh, whose main function was to receiving offerings. So it was a sort of uh, vital force, vital power of the deceased. Wow, it seems like there's so many different things and, and rules and, and like stories. It's fairly complicated. It's complex. It wasn't just a body and soul. Mm-hmm. But the individual had different parts that would take action, being really performative after death. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, interesting uh, to then to to look at the text and at the images of their uh, journey in the netherworld. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit. Well, be- before I get to that, I, I want to ask about the netherworld. Is the netherworld, when I hear netherworld, it... it- maybe it's just modern society it makes me think of this like negative place like not like we would think of nowadays like heaven is it more like a hell or and who has access to it could it be just the elite or or could it, uh, the everyday person get there as well there was a part of the netherworld that we find depicted all again on, mainly on those magical papyri of the book of the dead that were buried uh, with the deceased or on the tomb walls, where we see a part of the netherworld that looks like what we will call the hell. So mm-hmm. a region made of fire, also mm-hmm. with the damned that are being uh, men who have been are, are being punished in the netherworld by the gods and the demons of the netherworld. But on the other end, other parts of the netherworld uh, resembles instead uh, mounds rivers, bodies of water, the um, cultivated land uh, of ancient Egypt. So it was uh, other parts of the netherworld were, were a sort of mirror of, of, the, of the planet Earth, basically, mm-hmm. of the Egyptian landscape, mostly. And so it, that's interesting. And uh, I believe ev- everyone, everybody had access to the netherworld, uh, but... Um, the king and the elite are those who have uh, privileged a- access because they can have all this magical equipment that they need in order to recognize the demons and the gods in the netherworld, have the magical spells to recite in front of these uh, demonic guardians in order to pass through gates in the netherworld is a sort of access to a sacred area. What was the temple on earth, we could say, is the same initiation, it's a process of initiation. So you need the special knowledge. Mm -hmm. And who get this knowledge, at least from what we found, are the king and the elite. Normal people, let's say, they they would not be able to afford this uh, beautifully illustrated papyri or beautifully decorated tombs and coffins. But we think they believed anyway in the netherworld and they were hoping to access it. And that's why even in the um, poor burials, for instance, we find objects that were uh, very important for the dead and that he, he or she were hoping to bring with them in the netherworld. So they had 
believes in uh, uh, life after death. When we know it also from a series of text where it is said indeed that it's important also to live a good life on earth in order to be uh, then also to, to have access to the netherworld and being judged by Osiris, who is the Lord of the dead and also the judge of the netherworld, being judged positively during the what they call the final judgment. So this idea of final judgment is something actually similar uh, what we have also in, for instance, monotheistic religions and mm -hmm. the fact that you need to live well on earth and because you will be judged by God at the end of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. So for the average person, a burial, the poorest people in, in ancient Egypt, would they still be mummified? Is that kind of standard practice or is that not the case for everybody? You still needed to afford a certain amount. Yeah, uh, so they were using also sort of natural mummification in many periods of the long Egyptian history, since indeed the dry sand and the dry air of the desert would permit the, 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 the body to, to, to be kept in the sand. They were just burying the body in the um, shaft tombs, in hole, basically in, uh, in the ground, so that the body would stay intact. Mm. So that was a sort of much cheaper mummification. Then we found, of course, mummified bodies uh, that were uh, really uh, clearly made by skilled doctors, skilled mummification priests, and uh, other mummified bodies that you can see were uh, made with yeah less sophisticated, let's say, techniques. Oh, got it. Makes sense. Yeah, just trying to get people to the netherworld using whatever resources that they had. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the the kings and the elite. I mean, how many movies have been made about mummies and, and it just the entire world is fascinated by that. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, a pharaoh or uh, someone at the top of society passes away? What is the traditions around that? Yeah, so they had to go through a series of ritual. They had, uh, of course, a big following of relatives, uh, servants, uh, in the case of the king, uh, officials, high officials uh, who work for him, and all the priestly circle. They were all working for a successful, let's say, burial of the of the king or of the elite person. So they were, there were a lot of rituals happening in front of the tomb, like the opening of the mouth ritual, when you empower the body of the deceased or his uh, statue or coffin before burying the body, so that you are sure basically that the body uh, will stay intact and strong and the person can reactivate his, his uh, body functions also in the netherworld. So the, the ritual of the opening of the mouth is very much represented uh, for kings and for private uh, elite individuals. But also the, the same embalming uh, ritual was taking a long time. They say from 70 days, but also in some cases we heard about ritual for a queen, for instance, taking more than 300 days. So oh my it, goodness. Long. It also depended, we think now, from how long the body will need to in order to dehydrate. So mm. it's interesting to see how also they, they wrote instructions on how to mummify a body very carefully. So there were priests that were specialized in that, and of course also priests that were also doctors and knew very well the human body. Yeah, it seems like you could make a good living as a a, a, mum of, a mummy doctor or... or <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to call them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of uh, rituals, offering rituals, bringing how to bring the offerings, where, what spells to recite when you bring the offerings, especially the tomb of the king was also... Uh, a very important cu cultural place so where the tomb was very often already at the time of the pyramids uh, placed together with the temple so there was a temple attached to the pyramid and the temple 
or the two temple even in, in the pyramids were devoted to the rituals while the, the pyramid was the tomb itself, right? Mm. Because of course, once you close the tomb, all the rituals have to uh, keep happening outside the tomb. They could not, of course, every time open up the tomb to- Got it, yeah. And ideally these rituals should be uh, performed forever. So mm. they believed in the fact that the priest and the heirs of a family especially royal families and elite, they will continue to celebrate the deceased king. And uh, kings also had at a certain point in the um, second millennium BC, they start to have uh, funerary temples, as we call them. So mm -hmm. temples for the cult of the deceased king, together with some, some gods often associated to these temples. Oh, wow. And the cult of the dead was a big thing for the king and the elite. Sounds like a horror movie could be made about the, the cult of the dead. It sounds like a... Uh, creepy, but actually it wasn't because for them it was a feast. So mm. dress with their, best, with, with their best clothes and uh, go to the tomb bringing all kinds of good things to eat, to drink, incense and uh, clothes. It is represented really as an occasion for celebration. Yeah, that's wonderful. Morning. So the morning, scenes of morning, we found them only do, um, when the funeral procession is represented. Then we see those morning, generally women, but sometimes also men. Mm -hmm. All the, the loss of the dead, like, like it happens today. Yeah. If you're listening to this podcast, one of the reasons may be because you're interested in having your death or a, or a loved one's death be celebrated in, in a different way, to, to think outside the box a little bit. I, I personally really like the idea of that. And that's why I'm partnering with a company called Spirit Vessel, who creates these guided personalized ceremonies for yourself or, or a loved one. Well, just to give you a little bit of background, Spirit Vessel is a sister-owned company that is bringing sacred ceremonies around death back into the home in a beautiful and meaningful way. I love it. I love the idea of, of making it more personal. And I've experienced wakes and funerals that it felt so cold and, and wish that I could inject a little bit more personality and, and more storytelling to help the grieving process. Spirit Vessel has these handcrafted ceramic urns and personalized celebration of life ceremony packages that can be done in the comfort of your home or through webcasting services. Whether you're grieving the loss of a loved one, preparing for an imminent death, or taking steps to plan for your own death, Spirit Vessel provides resources to help you respond from your heart with creativity and courage. So basically you can design your own creative and, and personalized intimate ceremony that represents the person who you're celebrating. And there's also tips to help people who are grieving going forward. So whether you're interested in the celebration of life ceremony packages, or you'd like to check out or order one of their handcrafted ceramic urns, which are so cool, by the way, check out Spirit Vessel. And if you do order anything, feel free to use the promo code DEATHSPACE for free shipping. If you're like me, it could be really hard to come up with the words to say in a card. I know, I always laugh too, because talk about 10 years of improv training down the drain. <laughs> Not being able to come up with anything. But especially, that's especially, but that's especially, but that's especially so. I don't know why I can say especially. There you go, perfect, I can say it. <laughs> During times of grief, or when someone loses someone. But thankfully, there's the Cardis Studio. There are no words to comfort in a time of deep loss. But you send a card because you care. Yeah, because as we've learned through this podcast, sending something, saying anything, is better than saying nothing. The Cardist Studio creates your message, writes it in your card, and mails it for you. See? They'll help you out. You have the intention, the Cardist has the words, bing, bang, boom. All you do is pick the card and tell why you're sending it. No anxiety, all care. For a message from your heart, but not your hands. Just sit back and enjoy your relationships. You know, you won't have that awkward feeling like, ah, was that too much? Did I say too much? Am I talking too much? 
As I'm literally talking too much, as opposed to figuratively talking too much, Pat. All right. <laughs> My inner voice is kind of mean to me. TheCardistStudio.com, thoughtful, just got easy. And better yet, you can use the promo code DEATHPOD, one word, for 10% off all orders. You ever lie in your resume? Huh? Look at me. Look at me when you're lying. No, you should never do that. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> But it can be daunting to, to look at a, a job listing, see everything that you have and, and things that you probably don't have. But we can fix that with My Software Tutor. My Software Tutor offers three levels of real time Zoom based courses with a live instructor. So I'm going to keep you on task. They've seen it, they've heard it, they've seen the resumes, they know the holes, but they're here to help. They all deliver practical, functional business skills in a friendly and supportive environment. It'd be funny if it really wasn't a supportive environment. Like, when are you going to understand this? <laughs> of course, that's not the case. That's just the anxiety or, or, or reliving fear dreams we had as children. These courses will increase your marketability. The job market couldn't be better right now. So it's a perfect time to invest in yourself and, and improve that resume. Whether you're an employee, job seeker, consultant, or contractor. You can sign up for these classes at mysoftwaretutor.com and use the promo code POD20 to save 20% off all registrations. Would you look at that? All right. Enjoy that new job. Well, do you, I, I'm getting the sense that, general, generally speaking, ancient Egyptians weren't, seemingly weren't terrified of death. They more viewed it as a, a necessary passing and, and something, you know, to remember and to celebrate. Do you think that's the case? Oh, definitely. I mean, they were thinking death like a new life, as I say, a new beginning, and they were preparing for it. So differently from us in our modern society, you tend to ex exercise death, <laughs> like to, you don't want to think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they had no issues to think about death. That's great. It's it's funny that something back then, it, 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 it something that's lost that I think modern society would, would benefit from uh, being able to talk about and think about death. Yeah, definitely. Even if we, we found some literary texts that were death is seen as actually a dark word, it's like in other society. So death is the end of everything. And so you should enjoy life. We found some of those texts, but they seem to be mostly literary texts for entertainment. No. And it has nothing to do really with what they wanted for their own death. Oh, okay. <laughs> when you hear about, I, I, I don't know, it's tough to separate what's Hollywood from what's fact. So hopefully you can help me with that a little bit. But these temples and the pyramids, you hear about these curses upon people who, who open them. Is that, number one, is that real or is that just like a movie thing? And two, is that just to protect the bodies, like you said, having to keep them intact so that they're preserved for the netherworld? So there are real curses in ancient Egypt that were written especially on the, uh, the entrance of the tomb because mm -hmm. Didn't want their tomb to be, to be destroyed so they could write at the entrance of the tomb for the passerby, the, if you destroy this tomb, you will be destroyed forever as well, something like that. Or if you pass by and you don't leave some offerings, then you will pay for it. So there is a tradition of, let's say, curses, some of which are also very uh, violent, but um, mm -hmm. there are not too many compared to other texts like uh, prayers, hymns, or magical spells for the deceased to, to be able to become a god, for instance. So there are not many, and well, compared to the, let's say, the, the, the idea of ancient Egypt that we, we look at in movies, they didn't really believe that the mummy could wake up, for instance. They didn't mm -hmm. believe the dead uh, would... Uh, come out of the tomb in a scary way. They believed in the communication between uh, the living and the dead. We even have uh, documents that we call letters to the dead or appeals to the dead where 
uh, you write to your deceased relative, can be your son, your father, your mother, you ask something, you're expecting an answer from them. So they believe that the dead was around, but not in the scary way that uh, we, we see in the movies, let's say. Mm. Well, it's nice. That's a, that's a nice thought. Yeah. So in the mummy in itself will never come back. The mummy stay in the coffee. Right. It's trying to enjoy, uh, trying to become a god in another world. It's the, they've got a lot to do. They can't be coming back to haunt people. And the bodies will stay intact in the coffin so that the spiritual part can move around. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe the mummy will come back. That's funny. <laughs> about the discovery of Tutankhamun, the curse of Tutankhamun that then gave rise to all this tradition of movies of the mm -hmm. mummy. Okay, so that's where it stems from. Yeah. yeah. Do you think Egyptologists, I mean, uh, I'm sure going back a hundred years when, when the tombs were being opened up, do you think Egyptologists ever gave a second thought about uh, going in there because of those curses? I don't think Egyptologists are easily scared mm -hmm. since everywhere since uh, <laughs> the Egyptologists they were entering also tombs that were difficult to enter you know rock cut tombs uh, subterranean tombs they were so eager to discover bodies and treasures and texts and understanding what was going on and who was the owner of the tomb that I don't think they've never been stopped by the, the fear of a curse. The locals were more scared. scared Got it. More that, well, we should leave the pharaohs in peace, right? But in the end, they also, the local workmen in Egypt are modern Egyptians, so I guess they're not scared anymore neither. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, the pursuit of knowledge in, in such a case is just overwhelming and, and just so fascinating. Well, how has working as an Egyptologist, if it has, uh, changed your perspective on, on death or life? Studying Egyptology made me very much interested in religious beliefs in general. And indeed, uh, in my study of the Egyptian religion, Egyptian view on death, I like to compare with what other societies, ancient and modern, believe about death and the gods and what we call dimension that is not on earth, right? Something supernatural uh, or anyway, uh, something that you believe even if it's not scientifically proved. Mm -hmm. uh, the way it shaped my life is that indeed it gave me, uh, I think, a more neutral comparative perspective on idea of death. It made me appreciate really how humankind really can, can elaborate on, in the end, on, on hope. Thinking that this life on earth is not the end, it's not the only thing that we have, but we have more. And so all main all religions in the end have some idea about why you should uh, uh, be good <laughs> in this life. It has to do with something else coming after. Mm -hmm. Incarnation can be life with the gods like the ancient Egyptians can take different forms. But there are so many differences, but also many points of contact among beliefs that I find it really interesting, uh, simulating to always compare the ancient Egyptian religion with other religion. Yeah. Well, do you have a, a religion besides, or a re religion that's around today that you have specifically studied and, and have compared? Well, I look at other traditional uh, African religions or African rituals, magical tra traditions, because indeed all this, this aim of Surviving death uh, had to do a lot with the use of what we call magic, so sort of uh, uh, performative power to make things happen, to be protected on li in life in the netherworld, and this happens in many other societies in Africa. So I like to compare with other African, also modern uh, uh, religions, since anyway, Egypt is indeed in Africa. On the other end, uh, uh, Egypt is also very much connected to the Middle East mm -hmm. and in particular with the ancient civilization of Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. uh, influencing each other. And it's also 
uh, interesting how the Egyptian religion uh, accepted uh, foreign gods and foreign uh, traditions, mm -hmm. the, especially from Mesopotamia and uh, what we call the ancient Near East, uh, so your uh, area of uh, modern uh, Palestine, Israel, and so on. Yeah, well, you have such a an interesting job. Uh, my goodness, it's so it's so great to talk to you. Is there anything you think I'm missing? Is there anything else you think I should mention about how the ancient Egyptians viewed death or or your life or anything in between? I don't think so. I think we we cover cover pretty much um, everything. Maybe just I can still say that uh, it's interesting how ancient Egypt is still, I would say, seen as a living uh, tradition in the sense that the ancient Egyptian uh, religion and the ritual and its rituals are still practiced nowadays by many currents of thoughts and uh, religious groups, like thematic groups, we call it, that believe still in the power of those rituals and in many cases believe still in the Egyptian gods. Hmm. So ancient uh, religion and ancient civilization but still alive today that is interesting let's hope those those kings family members are still performing those rituals to keep them keep them going i hope so <laughs> well thank you so much for your time this has been so fun talking to you and yeah we'll we'll, we'll connect as this comes closer to coming out all right so you will uh, keep me posted yes we'll do have a great day you too it's crazy what's been lost in some senses, right? Like being less afraid of death. I mean, it's for, for different reasons. They they firmly believe that there was an afterlife and, and they would continue on. And, and of course, there are religions as still active that, that think that way. But then there's also atheists and, and agnostic. And there's just a lot of answers because nobody knows. But yes, that, that belief did help. Uh, seemingly, the ancient Egyptians feel less afraid of death. Which is the notion I'm looking to bring back here. Well, thank you so much, Sarita, for a fantastic insight into ancient Egyptians. Hope you guys like that. I want to remind everyone to check out my other podcast called That Gives Me Anxiety. It's going to be going weekly coming up here soon. Very exciting. And once again, I'd like to mention and thank the sponsors. Spirit Vessel, use the promo code DEATHSPACE, one word, for free shipping on personalized urns and the celebration of life ceremony packages the cardist studio you can use the promo code death pod one word for 10 percent off all orders and my software tutor you can use the promo code pod 20 for 20 percent off all orders thanks again to all those companies as always thank you so so much for listening have a great week and i'll talk to you on thursday mm -hmm.